All right, we're continuing with ES6. So this is video two. If you missed video one, you know, you want to watch that first, but it doesn't really matter because this is new stuff. So another great feature with ES6 is block scoping. At first, it doesn't seem all that useful, but then the more you use it, the more you appreciate it. So kind of how scoping works now, a miniature scoping lesson, where A equals one. If I were to make a function here, and go there b equals one well now this variable is in its own scope so after that function you know console log b nothing happens because b was not defined in scope so uh, but if you were to do a block so this is function scoping um, then block scoping is like an if statement so there's no function going on this is within the block so if I define var b equals 2 well now b is gonna console log 2 b has been defined basically it hoists it and then down here sets b equals to 2 that's exactly what's happening right now it's defining a variable in the scope and then changing that so what block scoping does is it allows us to use let and let define something within a block is really all there is to that so the two places you pretty much use blocks are if statements, if else statements, and loops. You know, for loops, you know, I don't know, I'll just say 20. We're looping 20 times. I'll save the, the time of that. So we're looping through 20 times. Each time we can now create a new B variable that is new for that loop and gets destroyed after that loop. So it's only used within this block. So that's that's actually really nice. Um, as a general rule, when you're coding ES6, it's just simple to remember, let is the new there. You really don't need to use there most of the time, unless for some strange reason you want to define a variable in this block, in this if block, that needs to now be accessible outside of this block, which is pretty much a bad idea anyway, because you probably should be defining there b up there if you're going to do that and then changing b to 2. That's kind of more the correct way of coding that. Um, so start using let instead of air. That gets you 80% of the way. Uh, and then there's also this new const, um, foo equals 1. Constant is exactly the same as let. So, well, I shouldn't say it's exactly the same. It's the same as let in that it's block scope. So bar equals 2, and I try to log bar. Nope, get an error. Bar is not defined. Uh, because it's outside now if I change this to var bar well now bar is going to be two uh, because var is function scoped uh, but changing this to constant is again block scoped and constants cannot be overwritten uh, so if I were to then try to change bar to uh, bar equals three and eh, eh, get an error that doesn't work now if it's an object you can't change it to a different thing uh, but you can change that object. So if I say bar a equals one, and that's got a one, I love that I said two, uh, then I can change that. So I can mutate bar somewhat as an object. Still, I choose to call all my objects constants uh, because, you know, anymore we're really starting to realize as JavaScript developers that mutating a value most of the time is something you don't want to do. Uh, you want to define most values as constants actually. So I'm starting to use const as my default and then should there be some reason where I need to mutate a value, well then I'll change it to let. So it's kind of like this visual indicator. Oh, that's let. This value is going to get changed later on. So that's actually kind of a really good practice that me and my team have found is use constants for everything, absolutely everything. Everything's a constant. Um, and then you shouldn't usually have to change values of things. And if you do have to change a value, well, then you see let. And when you see let, it's kind of like this little pop in your eye. Okay, this value is going to change for some reason. I need to be aware of the fact that this is going to change. So that's kind of a good practice we found there. Let's see next, let's talk, uh, let's do classes. I can't believe I didn't mention this yet. So classes are a huge deal for JavaScript to have now. Um, it's not necessarily huge functionality, it's just that every other language pretty much speaks in terms of classes. So, uh, you know, for those of you guys who may not know it, which shouldn't be most developers, but you know, you could do function, parents, and so this is your constructor, and then you'd have to go parents.prototype, 
dot foo equals function, you know, so adding your adding your functions that way, which is really not that bad, but uh, now you can actually go class parent. And then I can go constructor. And then I can actually go foo bar. And then I can go ver parent equals new parent. Parent.foo, do some things. Um, and then also with ES7, which so if you're using Babel, you can transpile ES7 just fine. I'm not sure if Tracer does it or not. Uh, you can also define some static class properties, which is an ES7 thing. I can go age equals 34, and then parent.age equals 34. So that's also nice. You can add some static properties. That was not a part of the initial ES6 spec to have properties or static properties. I can also go static foo. Um, and then parent is actually going to, that's going to be parent.foo is going to be that method. So that's also kind of nice, uh, which again, capital P parent, that is foo going on here not lowercase p parent, which is this. So the reason I called that parent is because then you can extend things, which is nice. You don't have to have some sort of little utility method that you write yourself. Child extends parent, just as you'd expect it to be. I get my own constructor. Can it call super, which is going to, of course, call that guy. And then I can add my own foobar boz. So then I can go new child. And then child can do boz or child can do foo because I've inherited all the methods. Actually, child can't do foo because that's static. Child can do bar. There we go. And so that's kind of your ES6 classes. Um, and then let's go ahead and look at, let's go look at arrow functions. I like arrow functions. Um, there's also generator functions, which are the huge new functionality. So this adds a lot of new power to JavaScript. Uh, uh, a lot of new power, especially in how you handle async. I have a video that's dedicated to generator functions. I'll put the links to that in the description. Uh, Cause they're a little complicated to understand the first time around. They're simple, but they're complex. So uh, I'll, I'll leave you those links. Uh, let's look at arrow functions. Arrow functions. Arrow functions at first seem just like a new syntax for writing functions, but the more you use them, the more you very much enjoy them and the more you understand some of their intricacies. So uh, if I was to say ver foo equals a function, uh, and then we're just going to return a plus b. There we go. So you can write this as an arrow function. And you can go ver foo equals a, b, arrow. And then I can return a plus b. So at first, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. If I want to convert this function to an arrow function, I just delete function, add an arrow. Okay, well, that's kind of ground level. It looks a little bit cleaner, a little less typing. Uh, but then there's actually some more things that they add for you. Uh, so it's it's mostly found very helpful when you're passing functions as arguments. So do something with A and B as a callback, right? So we're going to do something there. Well, that definitely cleans up um, a callback there. Return A plus B. Uh, so if I was to convert this to an arrow function, I could really make this a one-liner and it gets a lot cleaner. So that's nicer. Now it's a little bit more visual. CoffeeScript did a good deal with this. This seems to be a cue that they took from CoffeeScript, which was nice. Um, and then there's also what's called implicit returns. And this is only applies to one-liners. So if, if there's a one-liner, I'm able to drop these curly braces and whatever is here uh, automatically gets returned. So I can just do A plus B. So this is the exact same as what I had going on there. Ah, now we're starting to really see some clean stuff. So again, I can do with brackets return A plus B. Or if I'm dropping those brackets, I if I'm keeping it to one line, I can drop those brackets and drop that semicolon. Um, and it's just going to automatically return A plus B. So that's very cool. Also, if you're on a one liner and you only have one argument, I can drop these parentheses. And I can just return a plus one, or you know, 
A++. So now it's gotten a lot cleaner. So if I just want to make a function that increments things, like say I want to map something, um, 0, 1, 2, and I want to increment all these, I can map these as val. There you go. So now that's going to give me 1, 2, 3. So that's really nice. It really is useful for things like mapping, uh, for filtering, sorting, lots of those underscore JS methods. Very, very useful to do arrow functions in there. Um, and then there's one more thing that's uh, very, very, uh, it can be tricky. You can forget that it does this, and that is it's, uh, it automatically binds context to this. It's called lexical context binding. And so kind of how this would work is uh, if you ever do a function and you want to bind it to this, uh, let's see. I just actually do it, code out an example here. Var module equals my age is 30. My age is actually 34, but whatever. And then foo is some function. And this is going to console log this dot age. Okay, that's going to work just fine. It's going to say, you know, console log 30. So if I run module foo, it's going to automatically log 30. Uh, but then let's say I do a set timeout. I want to time that out. Uh, and one second later, uh, console log this dot age. Well, that's not going to work because now this is a completely different anonymous context. Um, and I no longer have access to this dot age. So, you know, you used to have to fix that by then binding this, which just really feels janky. Uh, but that's kind of how you'd have to do that or you'd have to code the function out somewhere else and bind the function. So but arrow functions automatically do bind this. So that right there is the exact same thing. So now this within this function automatically points to module. It points to the context that you're in. So that's something that's very important to be aware of because if you're say, I'll use jQuery as an example, I'm doing something with jQuery and you give it an arrow function, well now you have overridden jQuery's value of this. So you can't do this anymore because normally jQuery would set the value of this to be you know, your event handler or if you're using an event binder, an event listener, uh, that's something you gotta be aware of. You probably would wanna use function instead because you need jQuery's this value. Um, or you really need that DOM event listener's value. You do not want this to be whatever the value of this is. So whatever the value of this is here is going to be the value of this for an arrow function in here. So that's something that's very, very important. So lexical binding. So that's a very important thing that goes on with arrow functions. Um, let's look into, but once again, that's, that's extremely helpful. The vast majority of the time, it is extremely helpful for this to be bound to whatever is outside of it. So most of the time, I feel like that's what you want to happen. Um, last but not least, let's look into ES6 modules. So module systems, you know, you're probably using require. Uh, my module. There we go. And so how my modules defined inside is going to be module.exports dot foo equals function. You know, there's that. And then of course you're going to export bar. And then to import these later, you know, in another file, you've got to go very my module equals require my module. And then you've got to go there, foo equals my module dot foo, blah, blah, blah. And so to do this now, you could just change this to import foo, for import my module. Man, I can't type this one. Import my module from my module. So that's what you would do in Node or if you're using Require.js browser or Fire Webpack. So that's actually a lot cleaner. These really stand out as I'm not your code, I'm an import. So these at the top of the file, they do have to be at the very top of the file. So way down in the file, you cannot do an import. These have to be at the top. 
uh, but it's nice. This syntax really stands out as uh, just it just feels correct at the top. And you can also destructure this. So I could uh, I could go foo bar from my module. So now I'm not actually importing the my module variable. I'm just defining two variables in my scope, foo and bar. So that's really nice. Um, I'm finding this very useful for libraries like Lodash. So I could load in each, and I can load in omit from Lodash. And that really helps with more functional programming styles. I can then somewhere in my code just omit omit some key. Uh, so that's really, really nice if you're using a library like Lodash. Just pulling the things you need right up front feels very, very cool. Um, and then you can also, in your code, how you would actually write your module different if you wanted to, is you could just do, I guess your third way of exporting things is you could actually just replace module exports with a function itself. So, so then all of module exports is replaced with this function. So how you would recode this with ES6 modules is you would actually just go export export default function. Um, or you can actually just export any any variable as its name. So export function foo. So that's actually kind of exporting foo, which can be imported as foo. Uh, and then you can also export bar. Or I could export var foo equals three, which is very nice. So I'm defining this variable in here. And I'm also exporting that variable. So then I can import foo, which would be three here. I can import bar, which is a method. You can also do some as stuff, as foolish. So that's going to console log three, because I'm exporting foo, and I'm importing foo as foolish, and console logging foolish. So this just really cleans things up. It's, it's a syntax that I feel like JavaScript needs now that it's more modular. At first, I didn't really care about the export defaults. Oh, yeah, and then if you want just to do um, my module, say my module needs to be you know the whole thing, then I can just do export. Oh, I already showed you that. Export default, that can be some whole module that you export there. But I already showed you that, so you don't need to see it again. Um, and I like this syntax a lot. Like I said, I really like this really like being able to destructure out what you need from the very top. So that's kind of my take on ES6 so far. I'm loving it, loving, loving, loving it, loving using it. Um, and I guess one more useful thing, if you had a chance to look at the generators video, this will make sense. If you didn't look at the generators video yet, this will not make any sense at all, but you can do what's called async functions, especially if you're using Babel.js to transpile. Um, then they do what's called async functions. So you could do async function, and that's basically a generator function. Uh, so whenever you define an async function, it's a generator function, and anywhere inside, instead of doing yield, you can do await. So it's called the async await syntax. So I can await some, pr some promise, like say jQuery.get, since everybody knows jQuery ver friends equals some side.com slash friends. So we're going to go ahead and get that. Uh, apparently I only have one friend. And then I can console log that as if it's already been received. So async functions are basically converts them into generator promise, generator functions uh, that return a promise. So then I can actually, this whole function now returns one promise that is thenable. Um, that's kind of the short of it. But if you look into Babel.js, async functions are very, very cool, especially if you're doing a whole lot of async stuff, like in Node or something like that. Very useful. So that's ES6 in a nutshell. Hope you enjoyed the videos. Have a great day.